the floor is yours. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Andy. I'm a PhD student in Stanford University. Um, yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, actually two different works, both on tractable probabilistic modeling. Uh, so here's the first one. It's on using probabilistic circuits for variational inference and discrete graphical models. So the goal here is basically pretty simple. You're given a graphical model and you want to compute the partition function using variational inference. And we'll see why we run into some problems when the setting is discrete and how we're going to solve them by using probabilistic circuits. Um, so the standard setup is someone gives you a graphical model here on the right, and it sort of defines like a, a energy function that's log linear in the variables. Um, so if you can write out the entire sort of truth table, then you want to sum it all up to get your partition function. Uh, but this is not tractable. So basically one way to do approximate inference is by uh, variational methods. So with, vari with variational methods, what you want to do here is P is your target distribution. So P is what you can query the graphical model and to get sort of the energy so it's unnormalized. Um, and then Q is basically this proposal distribution that you're going to propose. And um, if you sort of evaluate this elbow here, so the closer your proposal distribution is to the target distribution, the better your estimate of the partition function is going to be. So the goal here basically is to try to learn an expressive uh, distribution Q that closely matches P. Um, so the cool thing here is any choice of Q gives a valid lower bound, even if your Q is sorry, very coarse, you can still work with it. Um, this means that you can use you know, very coarse methods like mean field or structured mean field. So mean field basically does some like fully factorized approximation, and this still gives you a valid lower bound. Um, or you can try to go super expressive and try to model Q with a neural network. Um, the problem being if you model Q with a neural network, then it's hard to evaluate this expectation. So you have to take a bunch of samples to evaluate this. And as we'll see, uh, these samples run into problems when the setting is discrete. Um, yeah, so we have to take samples, Q from X, uh, X from Q, and then evaluate this inner term. Um, yeah, if you basically, uh, people have known this problem um, for a while that if it's discrete, then your samples, you can't back propagate through them and you have uh, issues optimizing your proposal distribution. So maybe just like more of a graphical intuition of what's happening. So if you have like a continuous sort of target distribution and say this black circle is your proposal distribution, you want your proposal to sort of match your target. So you might draw a sample and then you can evaluate the gradient basically with respect to the red proposal. And you'll see that you have to move this way closer and you can draw another sample and you can draw another sample. So basically it's very easy to actually optimize this because you have access to the gradients. So after a few steps, then you will sort of align your proposal distribution with the target distribution. And so your proposal distribution can be you know, very expressive because it's easy to optimize these. Now, when we have sort of discrete settings, it's harder to visualize, but we can think about maybe having our discrete setting having 16 possible values and each value has like a different uh, PDF. So like the larger the cir red circle here is, the larger the PDF. And our goal is basically to match all of the black circles with the size of the red circles. So now it's kind of off. We like we need to increase the size of this one. We need to decrease the size of these ones. So again, similar to the continuous setting, we want to um, take samples and optimize our black circle. So what happens in discrete settings, though, when you take samples, you sort of realize that at these two points, you need to shrink the black circles. But you don't get sort of any information about any of the other points. And so in high dimensions, this is obviously a problem because there are exponentially many number of different points. And so if you're not following the gradients, if you can't backpropagate through the gradients, then your optimization becomes very inefficient. So I hope this part makes sense. Um, like if we if we never sample this 
big red circle, like it, it's going to take you a while to eventually optimize for it. Um, so yeah, so basically this can be summarized as there's no information around the samples you took, um, leading to high variance and you can't easily optimize. So how do we go about um, solving this? Well, as we said before, we can still think about trying to do analytic optimization. So when we use something like mean field, we don't actually have to take samples to evaluate the elbow uh, because sort of the proposal distribution Q is so simple that we can just evaluate the expectation in closed form. And that allows this to optimize sort of everywhere at once. So when the target P is log linear, which we have in these graphical model settings, um, we, can, we can basically avoid sampling and use analytic optimization. Um, but we also sort of don't want to just use these standard methods because they're sort of not expressive enough. So the question of this work is, can we use something in the middle? Can we have something that's slightly more expressive, but can still support analytic optimization? So we're going to talk about these sum product networks, um, what they are and how they help us solve this problem. So, so what are they? So you can think about a bunch of different modeling families that you can choose from. So at the very weak side is maybe mixture models. These are very tractable. These are just like a bunch of mean fields, but weighted sum together. Or you can try to uh, focus on expressive models. Here, I sort of crossed it out and talked about expressive efficiency. Uh, the nuance being that even mixture models, if you take enough mixtures, it can be very expressive. So we just want, we want to talk about being efficient in terms of like your model size. Uh, so, so, so these, you know, standard uh, deep generative networks out there are very expressive, efficient, but they're sort of not helpful for our problem here. So somewhere in the middle, you can have models like determinant of point processes, uh, some product networks, uh, arithmetic circuits, which are similar to SBNs. Um, and so for the purpose of this talk, we're going to talk about SBNs, um, sort of lying somewhere in in the spectrum between tractability and expressiveness. So, so what are these sum product networks? So fundamentally, they take a bunch of base distributions. And here, these base distributions, you can think of them as just Gaussians, or, or in the discrete case, just a bunch of Bernoullis. And you want to take your the operations you're allowed to take, basically, are mixtures called sum nodes, where you just basically take some combination, mixture combination of the base distributions. You're also allowed to take product nodes that factorize. So you can take products of distributions if they're over variables, um, disjoint variable sets, basically. So you can do these in a bunch of ways. There are some constraints about how exactly when you can compose things together. But in general, you can do these pretty freely and it gets you basically a network of base distributions here and a bunch of products and sums. And so you can stack these together in sort of like a deep network layer. The cool thing is you can, after you do this, you can think about this as just another feed forward network that defines a computation graph from your inputs to your outputs. So you can evaluate forward pass. And the cool thing is you can also train via gradient descent. You can just take a backward pass through back propagation. So very similar to how you would train a neural network. And what this ends up defining is since we've taken a bunch of sums and products, you sort of implicitly define a multilinear polynomial over the base distributions. And basically in, in our paper, we show that uh, due to this multilinear polynomial property, you're, you can evaluate the expectation analytically when the target is, is log linear. That's pretty cool. Um, so these, these sum product networks, um, sort of when they were first introduced, the, the cool thing was you can compute marginals in one forward pass. You can marginalize over different variables in one forward pass. Um, this is cool, but actually, as we'll see later on, if I have time to present the second work, um, you can compute marginals using uh, sort of more expressive models too. So, so that's not sort of the only cool thing about sum product networks. Um, sort of, like we said before, the cool thing here in this work is that they can compute these elbows in close form when P is, is log linear, it is these graphical models that you might want to compute partition functions for. 
Okay. Hope that makes sense. So um, can I ask so a can I ask a question? Yes. Actually, two questions. So uh, here, I assume uh, each line is corresponds to a weight, right? So uh, when like when you sum and do a multiplication, is like yeah. The, so the train weights so the, for this. Yes, the edges are weighted for the sum nodes. So uh, each line leading into a sum node has weights, as we saw before, uh, maybe like 0 0.3, 0 0.7. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the product nodes don't have weights because they just take a uh, product of, of their base distributions. Okay, and so you can train this via gradient descent, but wouldn't yes. that then share the same uh, limitations that neural networks, for example, have when it comes to discrete variables? Yes, so that is true, but uh, basically, we're not training through gradient descent over samples of we're not so basically for neural networks, you would sample uh, x from your proposal, evaluate the sort of rough estimate of the elbow and then train gradient descent on that. Here we're sort of evaluating the entire elbow in closed form and we're doing gradient descent on the analytical elbow value. Okay. So you can think of this as basically you're doing gradient descent by sampling everything at the same time, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you. May I ask a question as well? Yes. yes. Do you change only the weights of the edges, or do you also change the parameters of the base distributions with gradient descent? Like, are they yeah. to be optimized so as well? In the, if you want to use, you can you can do um, change the parameters of the basis of the basis functions as well. For example, if they're Gaussians, you might want to change their mean. Um, but actually, since for what I was doing, since everything is sort of Bernoulli, um, I did not change their parameters uh, because I guess the, the p value in your Bernoulli, you can just add a sum node. So I basically, I had one that was always zero, one that was always one, and then I had a sum node that basically controlled how much you weighted, but you can think about it either way. It's kind of equivalent. Cool. Okay, cool. So yeah, going back to our picture, basically. Yeah, we're, we're so here we're not sampling anymore. We're sort of treating this entire elbow as one sort of scalar quantity that we're evaluating. So we'll evaluate this scalar quantity in one pass. And then we back propagate on that, on that value. So essentially what's going on is we can get exact gradients everywhere and sort of optimize every single point um, in your landscape. Okay. So yeah, I'll go over the experiments. So here is a, on a 16 by 16 Ising model. Um, actually in our paper, we had up to 32 by 32. But for that, we couldn't compute the ground truth. So the plot is not as intuitive. Um, but here we can compute the ground truth via um, you know, these like uh, graphical model libraries. So we can see how far we come with our lower bound. Uh, so this is with our method. Um, sort of, if you can use mean field, which is also a lower bound as we saw analytically structure mean field. And if you use our method, you get a better estimate of the log partition function. Um, you can also use loopy belief propagation. Um, but for these settings, sort of our method currently is doing the best. Um, OK, yeah, so just a summary, basically, in discrete settings, taking samples is problematic because you can't back propagate through them. So we're going to use probabilistic circuits, like some product networks, which are more expressive than mean field or structure mean field but still allows us to compute gradients analytically so we don't have to sample. And this works whenever the target P is log linear. So for example, graphical model inference, um, or you can think about maybe max and reinforcement learning. If you have a large action space, for example, um, and you want to um, like, yeah, do basically learn like a max entropy policy. Um, I think, Maybe even like this might be applicable for like multi-agent settings uh, when you know some sort of reward structure is should be uh, log linear or like your your reward is linear, but then um, I guess your your uh, 
if you take the max entropy perspective, then your Q value might be log linear. Okay, um, are there any questions then? If not, I can move on to the second one. I have a question. So if I understand correctly, the uh, innovation of this work was to uh, use uh, probabilistic circuits like the sample networks to do a variation of inference on uh, um, graphical models in which the target is log linear. Yes. And, and aren't there other approaches that use the sample networks for variation of inference or like? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I suppose, I, I think, so I guess you can use them in the, in the, in the same way you would like use a neural network for various neural networks, like sample funding and optimized funding. But I think, yeah, I think where they shine is basically when you can compute this elbow analytically. And so far I'm, I'm aware that you can do this when it's log linear, but I'm not sure if it's not. Okay. And could you please maybe also I don't know if you did explain this already in the first few slides, but can you define again um, what the target log linear means? What, what, oh. what, yeah, what was the case in which P is log linear? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I think this is the very first step. Um, oops. Oh, I think I scrolled too fast. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so I think in the typical settings, people, give you like a graphical model here and your edges here basically sort of define uh, basically the relation between two variables. So you might say, say like in a Ising model, you might say x0 and x1 should be um, tied together. So you might have a positive edge like one here. So basically now you take your truth table and whenever you assign a complete instantiation to all your variables, you're going to have a term that basically says like x0 times x1. And then so whenever x0 and x1 are both 1, then your sort of energy goes up by 1 mm -hmm. or it goes down. Or... And then you basically have a bunch of these um, linear terms for each edge. And then you take your instantiation and figure out how many of them are satisfied and add together their, the coefficients of those terms then you're going to output a scalar like like here, which I've put in the exponents. If you mm -hmm. do, you might get 0 0.2 out of it. So now this 0 0.2 value is basically a linear function of your variables. And typically in, in the setting, um, in the graphical model setting, you take, you exponentiate that value. And then that is sort of the unnormalized um, probability for that this instantiation, and then you basically want to sum together everything and that's your partition function. So, so this is why, so if you take the log of this, then you get back this exponent, which we said is, is a linear function of your graphical model. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a direct LCD graph, right? Sorry, what was the question? The, the graphical model, does it have to be a direct LCD graph? Uh, I, I don't think it does. Yeah, it doesn't have to. Yeah, and, and a lot of like these Ising models are undirected graphs. Okay, so the Ising model is an example of. Yeah, of the... and so so maybe another example that um, some of um, some people were looking into is you can think about yeah like in reinforcement learning if you have the reward basically as a linear say so say you have a high dimensional action space. And your reward function is some linear function of the actions that you take in each dimension. Then basically, if you want to compute um, sort of like the uh, max entropy sort of policy, then you want to basically have your action sort of be proportional to like you take your reward and exponentiate it. And so you might have a similar setting there where it's you're interested in, in sort of doing inference on a log linear sort of target distribution. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, I, uh, I can present the second work.
Can you see my screen actually? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, this is uh, sort of more recent work on training and inference on any order autoregressive models the right way. So as we saw before, these the previous work was on probabilistic circuits, and those can not only compute marginals, but also compute these elbows in close form. Here we're going to talk about a specific another uh, modeling family which can compute marginals and are quite a bit more expressive than some product networks. Um, but um, of course, they, they can't like, compute these elbows in close form um, because that's actually very difficult. So basically, the way you should think about this is if you're just interested in computing marginals, then you should look into these any order autoregressive models. So um, the overview is we're going to talk about start by talking about autoregressive models, which you guys are probably familiar with. So these are powerful models, but they have trouble with marginal inference. And so people have come up with these any order autoregressive models that can do marginal inference. But in this talk, we're going to show that they have some inefficiencies in their training and inference. And we're going to propose basically a way to improve them. OK, so autoregressive models, basically, sorry. The goal is to model a high dimensional joint distribution, P of X. And this is very difficult to do in high dimensions. So we're going to uh, factorize it into a bunch of univariate conditionals. And so we just have to model these univariate conditionals via train rule, and we can get back the joint P of X. Uh, so think about like transformers, pixel CNNs. These are all sort of examples of autoregressive models. So again, we have our joint, and we want to model it with a bunch of univariate conditionals. So what ends up happening after you do this is then you can generate your data, sort of one pixel at a time, one character or token at a time. OK, so that's cool. So typically, sort of in, in generative modeling, you say that you've learned this joint distribution. You've learned this data distribution well if you can sample like a full data point, like a full image or a full sentence. Or if you, and if you can compute the likelihood of like a full data point. So we can compute likelihoods at a single point. And as we said, we'll do this by doing uh, factorization using train rule and evaluating these with our autoregressive model. So if you're just interested in dealing with sort of full data points, then, then so you're done and you can just use autoregressive models. But basically, a lot of times you actually have partial evidence. For example, mask image modeling, mass language modeling. If you're interested in hierarchical planning, you might know that you want to start from your house and get to the airport, but you don't know where you want to be anywhere in between. So you sort of have partial evidence about your trajectory. Bayesian optimization, so in BO or active learning, the setup is you query different points in your problem domain and you condition on this like partial evidence that you've uncovered and try to reason about the rest of the problem. Or a probabilistic programming, where you sort of take a graphical model, encode it as a program, and you might mask out certain variables that you don't have access to. You basically try to run inference. Uh, you can probably think of many more examples where you might care about partial evidence. But basically, in all these settings, what's difficult is that the evidence subset is different for every query. And you don't know in advance which variables you can condition on. So this is a little bit different from these like label conditional generative models, where you know where you know in advance you're going to condition on the class information. Here you don't know what you're going to condition on in advance. So that's the difficulty. So basically, to tackle the, these, we need uh, sort of generative models that can compute marginal um, likelihoods. So here, um, E is a subset of variables. You can think of this as a bit mask, um, basically. So if you have n variables, this tells you like a, which subset of the n variables you can observe. So we need to compute this quantity. Uh, related quantity is conditionals. Basically, you condition on the partial evidence, and you want to fill in what, what you have missing. So this is another quantity we might care about. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to treat them as the same thing because you can express conditionals as 
the difference of two log marginals. Um, so, so yeah, we're gonna focus basically on computing these quantities. So basically, we can ask ourselves: Can we add, can we just use these autoregressive models to try and do this? In our picture before, basically computing marginals basically amounts to high dimensional integration over the missing variables. So before we were only interested in a single green point, but now if you're interested in p of x one x three, you basically have to evaluate the joint but integrate out the missing variables you don't have. So this amounts to say in this picture, you have to compute the area between these two blue lines. Um, so that's obviously pretty difficult if all you have is the joint. So your one point insight right now here is that actually if the evidence subset is a prefix of the ordering, like if you care about P of X1 and X2, you can actually compute this with your autoregressive model because as we said, we have this factorization before. So we can just take the first two terms and that actually gives us the marginal of the first of x1 and x2. Now the problem being that if we care about a different um, subset that's not the prefix like x1 and x3, you can't do this trick anymore because you don't have the right building blocks. Okay, does this all make sense so far? Okay, great. So um, how can we sort of think about exactly what an autoregressive model is doing. We're going to go to this diagram here. Basically, we've said that our autoregressive model learned sort of four building blocks, p of x1, p of x2 given x1, x3 given basically all the variables before it. So we're going to represent these as the gray edges here. And using these, we can compute the marginals denoted in blue. So we can compute the joint by multiplying all these four together. But we can also compute, say, p of x1 and 2 by using the first two terms. So we can compute all the marginals where the evidence is a prefix, um, or x1, x2, and x3 by using these, these three terms. OK, that's cool. And then if we want to compute x3 and 4, we can't. Because as we said, we, that's not available in our model here. So if we just. Um, yeah, so basically to do this, we're going to talk about any order autoregressive models, which is something people have proposed. We're going to talk about uh, basically what they do, what they are, how they fix this problem. And then we're going to sort of introduce like an inefficiency with them, inefficiency about their model and how we're going to um, address those. So these AOARMs, we're going to, we're designed for inference on partial evidence. Um, Okay, so, so you might think you've never heard of these AOARMs before, but they actually just come in many different names. Um, for example, first introduced in 2014, but also you might have heard of BERT or Excelnet. These are sort of, you can think of them roughly as another um, member of this AOARM family. Um, and then in the recent years, there were more works on um, using them for continuous data or autoregressive diffusion models for text and images. So these have been sort of relatively popular recently. So we're going to see how they work. Um, so as you saw before, with one sort of forward autoregressive model, we can compute sort of these quantities, but we can't compute p of x3 and 4. So if we just want to patch this value, what we can do is we can learn on the reverse ordering. We, we can go 4, 3, 2, and 1. And of course, since we have the reverse ordering, we can now compute this quantity by taking q of x4 and then q of x3 given x4. Um, so as you might guess from the name, basically the trick here, here is we're going to try to learn on every ordering. So if we do this, now every mask you give me is going to be a prefix of some order, mask here being the evidence subset. So if I want to compute x1 and 3, then I, I say that I, got, I can make up an order, 1, 3, 2, 4. And now one and three is a prefix of this order. So I can compute this. Um, if you give me one, two, and four, I can make up another order. And this is a prefix. So I can compute this as well. So here, the question might be, aren't there like an exponentially many number of edges? Um, and yes, there are. And so basically, so that was the cool thing about all these previous work was that they showed that surprisingly, 
with the exponential number of edges, if you train on enough data with big enough model, sort of these neural networks can actually generalize uh, pretty well across these like different edges. Um, so yeah, so these are, so that's sort of the cool thing about these any order autoregressive models, they can compute marginal inference um, on very high dimensional data sets. So yeah, if there are no questions, I'm gonna talk about basically try to identify some inefficiencies and try to fix them. Okay, so uh, basically you're gonna notice that there's actually sort of redundancy in our model because if someone queries you for the joint distribution, here at the very end, like P of X1, one, two, three, four. There's sort of actually two ways you could answer because you could follow the bottom path or you could follow the top path. And so this might seem nice. Okay, we got two ways to answer. But if you think about it, um, it's sort of unnecessary. We just need one sort of answer. And so are, are we learning too much basically? Well, sort of yes, because we can omit this edge. We don't need this edge. And we can still compute all the marginals in this picture here because we, we, still, we can still reach every node here. So sorry, by omitting this edge, now we have less redundancy. Um, and, and so that makes learning easier. So now the problem is that if we wanna use every ordering, how do we go about reasoning about this? Because this was for a simple case where we just have two orderings. Okay, so then basically that brings me to our proposed method called MAC, mask tuned arbitrary conditional models. And this is our proposal for improving these AOARMs. So as a preview, we're basically going to reduce redundancy that we saw before, which will make learning easier. And this will give us actually state-of-the-art likelihoods among these um, arbitrary conditional models. So this is on the text eight character modeling data set, and we can do better on both the joint and the marginal likelihoods. So now we're going to talk about how we think about all possible orders. So basically we can try to you draw out a binary lattice. And so, so what is this, what's going on here? Basically for four variables, it's all possible. This is like the power set of over four variables. And each layer here basically corresponds to all subsets of that cardinality. So in the middle layer here is six ways to choose two from four. And what's the point of doing all this? Well, we can think about this univariate conditional P of X3 given X2 and four as this purple edge right here. So you condition on X2 and four, and then you go to the parent node, which has the extra variable X3. So you get P of X3 given two and four. Uh, so as you can tell, basically in this binary lattice, we have an edge whenever like a node is a superset of the previous node. Uh, we can get P of X3 given X1 as this edge right here. Um, and X2 given no evidence as this edge right here. Uh, so basically we can think about AOARMs and prior works as training by taking the joint, sampling a random order since they can do any order. So if you sample the order two, three, one, four, this amounts to tracing out this path. You go from no evidence to two, and then to two and three, to one, two, three, and then to one, two, three, four. So you do this and you basically maximize the log likelihood along this path. And you sample another order and you maximize the log likelihood along this path. And if you keep doing this enough times, basically, you'll train on many different edges and your model can do uh, marginal inference, can, can sort of answer with any order basically very well. So at, at inference time, when you want to compute marginal inference, someone gives you uh, evidence subset here like four and one. And your task basically is to go from the empty evidence to the node one, four, and you can pick any path you want. So here you can pick this path. And then, so you evaluate the log likelihood along this path and you add them together and that gives you your marginal inference output. Um, yeah, here's another example. You can do the same thing for one, three, and four. Okay, so that's great. That's basically gives us more intuition about what's going on in these previous works. I can ask a question now. Uh, yes. Is it guaranteed that if you go, for example, uh, the, the previous part one four, right? Yes. If you go first one and then one four, and then you do what you highlighted now, is it guaranteed that the marginal is, is the same? So it's consistent? Yeah. 
So it is, it is not guaranteed that they're the same. Um, but basically there were previous works that did some studies about how different these different orders would be. They even added a regularization term to try to make it consistent. And basically they found out that it doesn't really make a difference. Like in practice, they're very similar. Uh, so the order you pick will give you very, very similar answers. So their conclusion was basically, it, it doesn't really matter. So in practice, when people do inference, they just pick one path and they just use that as their answer. They don't bother with sampling many different paths. Thanks. Okay. So how did like in practice, what's actually going on? Well, these all these univariate conditionals edges are learned with a single weight tied neural network. Um, so if you're familiar with say like BERT, you can kind of think about it like that. Basically you take an input X, like a full input, and then you take the mask E, the evidence you can condition on, and sort of you feed it into the same model. It's a weight tied model. And then basically you predict the univariate conditionals. So, and you just do this many, many times and you train your single model. And this is nice, but basically the bottleneck here is that your model is gonna be capacity limited because sure your model can be very big, but I mean, there are so many different edges that basically the limitation is that your is basically the capacity of your model. So we're gonna try to sort of present our improvement. Basically, since the limitation is the capacity, we want to reduce redundancy to make things easier for our model to learn. So the insight here is that for every node, we only need one path from the root. Um, and so basically, this amounts to basically only, we can pick these red edges, you see, and you can sort of convince yourself that by using these red edges, you can get from the root to every other node you can completely forget about the gray edges. And if you're wondering how we pick these red edges, you basically take every node, like one, two, three, four, and you remove the largest element. So you remove four, and that gets you to one, two, three. When you remove three, that gets you to one, two. So if you do this, you get these red edges, and basically that's enough. We just have to learn these red edges and we can compute arbitrary marginal inference. Okay, the second improvement, is we want to wait by frequency. What does this mean? So at inference time, someone gives you a query and you evaluate the path, this path highlighted in red. They might give you another query, you get another path, more queries, another path. And if you keep doing this, you're gonna notice that some edges are naturally gonna be evaluated more frequently. In particular, these thick edges carry more descendants. So for example, this edge from empty to one, basically has to account for all of these queries in its subtree. That's a very, very big subtree. So intuitively, this edge should matter a lot more than say this edge from 23 to 234, which rarely gets queried. So we should sort of weight our training by this frequency. Okay, so as we saw before, our model was capacity limited. And we're going to fix this by reducing redundancy, training only on the, or training more frequently on these important edges to help with limited capacity. So another way to look at this is basically the previous objective takes all these univariate conditionals, a whole bunch of them, and just trains on all of them. And our proposal is basically saying, if you just want to do marginal inference, you can actually forget about a lot of them. And with the ones that are remaining, you should weight them according to how important they are. Okay, so that makes sense. That's basically our method, and I'm just gonna present the results. I can ask a question before the results. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you have to train uh, uh, most, like sort of regularize the training by training more frequently the most important edges. And I guess uh, in my head that should be the other way around, but because I'm thinking about it as a neural network, right? So ideally, if some parts are used less, they should get bigger gradients or, or somehow sampled more often because otherwise they would get less gradient updates if it was a neural network. But, but what are you referring to when you talk to the model? Yeah, 
I think that, yeah, I think here the edges are, are not like parameters of our model. These are sort of queries that we get at inference time. So if we get a query a lot more often at inference time, we should spend more effort during training to optimize for that query. Mm -hmm. And so if, if this is rarely queried, it's fine if we don't do so well because we only see it very rarely. So, so that's the intuition there. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's slightly different from when it's like parameters of our model. So, but ideally in training, you can uh, query uh, the way you want, right? So yeah, during training, we can query, we can um, train on whatever frequency, whatever weight we want. We we're proposing that. So if you know at inference time what the query distribution is going to be then you can basically wait by that frequency. And if you don't know what the query distribution is going to be, you might assume some adversarial setup where you want to not do poorly on any query, in which case you might sort of, that might correspond to some sort of uniform prior over the queries, in mm -hmm. which case you, you, you should still use our method to try to wait by the frequency, by the size of the subtree. And that will sort of inform you as to how much effort you should spend during training on optimizing each edge. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, so as for the experiments, so basically these baselines are the previous methods that we saw before. Uh, our first improvement was using only the red edges. Our second improvement was weighting by the frequency. And if you use both at the same time, then you get our method MAC. So you can try, we tried this on text eight character modeling. Um, and uh, yeah, so we can do better than basically the previous state of the art on the joint and marginal likelihoods. The caveat here is we didn't have enough sort of compute power to train to completion. So previous method trained for 14,000 epochs. We only trained for 3,000. But the cool thing is we can actually still beat their, um, their numbers. And as an upper bound, if you train a single order transformer, it gets 1.35 on this task. So this is sort of an upper bound because the transformer can't answer arbitrary marginals, but all these methods can. Okay, so what can you do with these? You can basically take a text snippet from your test data set. You can mask out randomly, and then you can use our model to uncover the masks. And so, and this example actually does quite well, um, except here, instead of person, it filled it in with lesion, um, which kind of makes sense because it's like a medical context. Um, so we also tried this on images. So we also do better than the previous baselines. And here, the surprising thing is we, we actually do better than the single order image transformer. Um, the hypothesis of what's going on is that an image data sets sort of data augmentation is really important. So by masking, we're sort of implicitly getting some data augmentation for free. Uh, so we can do the same thing. You take images from your test data, mask them out, and then you can uncover the mask. So it looks generally pretty nice, um, but you'll notice here some, some places here, like when you only condition on one pixel, obviously whatever you, <laughs> Recover looks nothing like what was before. Um, we tried this on CIFAR 10, which is basically the exact same as ImageNet. Um, but here, since people already use data augmentation, that we don't really see what we do worse than basically the single order transformers. And we can do the same thing where we take image, mask it out, and uncover. Okay. And then Another thing we tried was these continuous tabular benchmarks, which are just con con continuous data. And uh, basically, yeah, we, we also do better than previous baselines. Uh, here might be interesting that the first row is basically SBNs, as we saw in the first part of these talks, because they can also compute arbitrary marginals, uh, but they don't do as well. Um, and then there's uh, these arbitrary conditional normalizing flows. And then ACE is basically the same as another AOARM model. Um, 
Okay. And then sort of the last thing we tried was this like robotic shared autonomy, shared autonomy setup. So the way you can think about this is basically you try to do inference on your action space. So and you might have a robot with a nine degree freedom action. And you might have an operator that just, uh, just gives you a subset of the actions. And basically you want to learn assistive conditional policy that fills in the remaining action dimensions. And then so you can get a complete action and execute it in your environment. And so you can basically replace this using our method and you'll show that it sort of does better than because we, we sort of learn how to condition properly. And the upper bound baseline is 2.15, just to give you a sense. Um, okay, and then finally, um, how would we sort of implement this? It's actually just a few lines. So here is basically the baseline method, how you would sample the training masks. And to use our method, all you have to do is add this function, sorry, less than like 10 lines of code. And this takes care of using only the red edges and also sampling by their frequency. So it's sort of very simple to add on to these previous methods. Yeah, so the takeaways, basically these AOARMs are currently sort of state of the art for arbitrary conditional modeling with tons of applications, mass language modeling, in painting, hierarchical planning, probabilistic program inference. But uh, sort of the issue we identified is they try to learn too much. Basically this results in redundancy in their model and worse performance because these models have finite capacity. So in our work, we show how to just learn just enough to support arbitrary conditional modeling to reduce redundancy and give better performance. So yeah, that's all. Nice. Can I can ask questions? Yeah, yeah, open to okay. questions. So, uh, so I guess this is just, not just, but what you introduced is a, it's a method or a different way or a more efficient way, I would say, improved way to train any order auto regressive models, right? Yes. And then uh, you train it on some data and uh, show it, of course, instead of the R results. But what I'm wondering is, like, what is the actual model that you use? Is it like a pixel CNN with any order auto regression or? Uh, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the actual model we used was the auto regressive diffusion model, the ARDM. Uh, so, so here, ARDN, that's the actual architecture we use. So this is different for depending on the domain, actually. So for the text eight, they used a like a transformer. Um, and then for ImageNet, they use like a UNet with like ResNet attention blocks. And then for this one, for this one, ACE is basically the same as ARDM, with the difference being for their univariate conditionals, they use uh, energy-based models. So we did the same thing too. Basically, we just did whatever the baseline did. Uh, so it's not sort of like one unified architecture, it's domain specific, uh, but mm -hmm. sort of the objective is the same. And, and basically our improvement, we improve on the objective. So this sort of applies to any base architect architecture that you want to use. Okay, so uh, you basically take the same algorithms and switch the way of doing other regression, the way yes. or any other other regression. And yeah. uh, what's your insight on, on why it, it improves the state of the art? I mean, I, I see it's more efficient for sure. And it's uh, in a way a smarter way to do the algorithm, but um, it is not, immediately obvious to me that it should improve instead of the art because the other models, even as even if they were redundant, in a way they should still be able to model the same complex functions, right? Right. Uh, so I guess maybe one way to think about it is sort of everything, we've kept everything the same as the previous models, except now we have to learn fewer things. We have fewer terms in our objective. We sort of cut away the fat because some of these terms will never evaluate one. So it just becomes like a simpler model, modeling problem. Um, but, and then the cool part is that we can still sort of 
we haven't sacrificed tractability because we can still answer any marginal inference query. So we sort of just made the problem easier. Well, yeah, thanks. This is uh, actually a super cool approach that you, that you introduced. I really like this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I hope um, sort of the, I hope I tied it well with the first part of the talk, um, sort of the differences, like when you would use SPN versus these other types of arbitrary marginal models. Yeah. Yeah, it was super clear. Surprisingly clear the demonstration fair or the, the presentation. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no more questions, are there more questions? Okay. Then uh, in the case, I want to thank uh, Andy again. Thank you so much for the, for the very nice presentation. And then, uh, yeah, I guess we, okay. we'll uh, stay in touch later on with by email for follow-ups. Yeah, thank you. Sounds good. All right. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.